Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking about models of the atom. And to start off this topic, I want to go way back to the time of the ancient Greeks. Now, some ancient Greeks believed that all matter was made of indivisible, oh, indivisible, as in they could not be divided, indivisible. They believe that all matter was made from indivisible particles. So they believe that eventually if you got a piece of matter and started splitting it up and splitting it up and splitting it up in half again and again and again, eventually you'd reach a point where you cannot split that piece of matter in half again and you reach that indivisible particle. Now the Greeks had a word for this concept of indivisibility they they were they had a word which literally meant indivisible and that word was atomos which meant indivisible and from this word atomos i hope you can clearly see the word atom lingering around inside this word and this is the word this is where the word atom comes from from the Greek word atomos which, which meant indivisible nowadays there's all sorts of things to do splitting the atom well back then the, Greek, the Greeks didn't know that and named it the atom and that, that, that idea that it's indivisible still lingers on in the naming of the atom now in the 19th century a scientist whose name was John Dalton created a model of the atom and what his model basically involved was that atoms were these solid spheres which made up elements and different elements were made up of different types of these spheres so let's say this these blue spheres here were one type of sphere and these green spheres here were another type of sphere and this would be one element these 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 uh, these atoms of one type will make up this element and these atoms of a different type will make up a different element and he also thought that these atoms were indivisible in the later 19th century a scientist by the name of JJ Thompson JJ Thompson He created a theory about the atom based on some, some research and observation which he had made when he was researching the atom. He found that atoms had charge and he found that these atoms had even smaller negatively charged particles within them. Now he thought, hmm, well this isn't consistent with John Dalton's model. so. I'm going to make a new model of the atom. And he basically used this 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 these findings we, that he that he obtained from his research. He created a new model and this new model basically consisted of a sphere which was positively charged. And inside this sphere was embedded negatively charged electrons. So here we have an electron negatively negatively charged electrons and this model was known and is known now as the plum pudding model of the atom because it's sort of like a plum pudding you've got the whole cakey stuff here and then you've got the the plums the the electrons and JJ Thompson actually called electrons corpuscles we now know them as electrons. Now, J.J. Thompson had a friend. And J.J. Thompson's friend also was interested in the atom. This man's name was 
Ernest Rutherford and they actually worked together at a university in England this university was Cambridge University and Ernest Rutherford had his own team of researchers who helped him to create a clearer picture of what the atom might look like now as the model we have right now uh, not right now as in right now but from JJ Thompson's research the model which we had was the plum pudding model plum pudding model now Ernest Rutherford did some research to see if, if, if this was really quite an accurate model of the atom so what he did was an experiment which is quite famous today which is known as the gold leaf experiment the experiment well, meme, um, ex <laughs> experiment. and what he did was he got a gold leaf the reason why you use gold leaf is because gold has quite a huge nucleus and it's quite malleable it's easy to to to, to move to mold into a, a a really thin thin layer and what he did was he fired these particles at this gold leaf and what these particles were were nucleuses of helium atoms and if you look at the periodic table you might find that helium has a proton or atomic number of two so they have uh, inside their nucleus they have two protons and you might find that they have a mass number or oh, well, relative atomic mass if you look at the periodic table the relative atomic mass is four because they have two neutrons and two protons and well they didn't actually get these from helium atoms what they did is they used the radioactive source which was decaying and as radioactive source decays it often emits certain it emits energy in the form of different particles and one of the particles emitted from certain radioactive sources is alpha particles and what he did was he fired these alpha particles at this gold leaf and he tried to see using detectors whether or not all of these alpha particles are passing over to the other side around this area because if JJ Thompson's model was correct this was what should have been happening because if it was like a whole mass of, of, of positive charge it should have just passed through but maybe been slowed down a little bit what he found was that most of them did actually do what JJ Thompson's you would expect from JJ Thompson's model but there were some anomalies some of these alpha particles bounce back they didn't go straight through and eventually when they actually did decide to put detectors around this end they found out some of these alpha particles were in fact bouncing back and this was strange this was unexpected they thought this the, the alpha particle should pass through imagine imagine we have we have fired a cannonball at tissue paper what would happen the cannonball would pass straight through we do not expect it to bounce back but they were bouncing back so they needed to change the model of the atom to fit this new evidence and from this plum pudding model of having a whole solid mass the, what changed <coughs> all the changes which occurred was that Ernest Rutherford and well his assistants um, Ernest Marsden and Hans Geiger the new model which was created was that atoms consisted of a center which had a positive charge um, I don't know if they had discovered protons at this time but the center had a positive charge and this around this center with positive charge which they called the nucleus there were negatively charged electrons in a cloud around this positive charge and if you look at this what you can notice is that most of this atom most of this space here which the atom is within is empty space and that fits with the, ex with the research most of those alpha particles just pass straight through this empty space but some of them mm, got really close to the nucleus which was positively charged and the alpha particles are positively charged so what happened was positives their same charge so they repelled and the positive charges whoop they came close and they were like nope and they went away they went backwards this way 
uh, away from the positive charge. That's why they were deflected at angles greater than 90 degrees. So this is what Rutherford model involved. And this model of the atom was known as the nu nuclear, uh, that's not, model of the atom. And this nuclear model of the atom basically was, 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 was more accurate. You can see the comparison between this and the, the modern version of the atom, some of the, the, the modern atomic models which we use. Now, some modifications were made to Rutherford's model of this atom because research which he did showed that as the charge is increased as you move from element to element because the number of protons would increase let's say you've got one element like hydrogen helium what he found was that as the number of protons increased the, the increase in mass was not the same as the increase in charge it wasn't really linear it wasn't a linear relationship so he thought there must be some other type of particle inside this nucleus and and he predicted that there must be some sort of particle in that nucleus which has no charge because the charge wasn't going up so there must there couldn't have been a charge in it he predicted there was something in there with no charge and later on just as he had predicted the nuclear the the, the neutron was discovered by a scientist by by the name of James Chadwick and this helped develop his model of the atom from this positive neutral 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 positive and obviously the electrons uh, ignore this this is part of the old thing I was showing just now and well that was that was Ernest Rutherford's take on the model of the atom now, Niels Bohr, oh yeah, I forgot to, to point out something, because of the fact that J.J. Tom, I mean, Ernest Rutherford's research basically discovered the, the presence of the nucleus, he's often known as being the first nuclear physicist of all time. Now, the Bohr model, let's go into the Bohr model, as you move forward in time, There's another scientist, you know, was born, he was a friend of Ernest Rutherford as, as well as J.J. Thompson. He was a friend of Ernest Rutherford. And Niels Bohr created the model of the atom known as the Bohr model of the atom. So, yeah, the Bohr model of the atom. And... The reason why he made this model is because there were certain things which Ernest Rutherford's model did not really account for. Such as the fact that, okay, so you're saying that we have this positive charge in the middle and we have this ne these negative charges in cloud in, in, the, in the cloud around. If this is negative and this is positive, opposites attract. So why don't all of the electrons just spiral down and go boom into the center of the nuclear into the nucleus and boom the atom explodes um, well not explodes but the atom collapses we don't have much of an atom anymore if all of the electrons have just spiraled into the positive center because most of it's meant to be empty space now there's no where's the empty there's no more empty space so we don't really have an atom anymore so this couldn't have been the case because we knew that the electrons were not in the nucleus they were around the nucleus So this led to the Bohr model. Now the Bohr model basically consisted of a nucleus. Let me draw the nucleus in, in, in grey. I'll draw in grey this time. There we go. This was the nucleus. And we had, Ill wait, let me, yeah, let me draw the, all the shells. And there were specific energy levels where the electrons were located Ooh, ah, this isn't a very good circle but it will do it will do 
let me draw on the electrons now. Electron, electron, first shell, two electrons. The next shell, six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And let me just draw one here. And he created principles which went along with this model of the atom which he created. This isn't a principle, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just going to add some like um, labels. So these were the shells. These were, well, obviously, the electrons. These were, this, well, this was the nucleus. And, well, these are the principles which he came up with. The first principle which he came up with, Niels Bohr, he came up with in regards to his model of the atom was that electrons only existed in fixed orbits. Nowhere in between. This is what his model basically proposed. That electrons only fixed existed in these fixed orbits or shells as we call them. And they didn't exist here, they didn't exist here, they didn't exist here. They only existed here in these fixed orbits, here, here, here. Right? That was his first principle. The second principle which um, Niels Bohr proposed for his theory of the, the model of the atom was that each shell has a fixed energy. So each shell has a fixed energy. This basically meant that the ones the electrons which are in, in shells closer to the atom had a lower energy level and it was a fixed energy level, a lower energy level than say this shell or this shell. And and these shells out here had a higher energy level than this shell, and this had a higher energy level than this shell. Which leads on to the third principle. And that third principle uh, I uh, what colour should I use here? Um I'm going to just use white. His third principle was that when an electron moves between these fixed energy levels, or, or shells, EM as an electromagnetic radiation is either absorbed and electromagnetic radiation would be absorbed to, to, to for the electron to gain energy as in so let's say it wanted to get from here which is a low energy level to here to a high energy level based on the principle of thermo, the, the law of thermodynamics energy can't be created or destroyed so it must get from somewhere and it gets it from the electromagnetic radiation as it gets this electromagnetic radiation it would jump from let's say if it was this one it would jump from there to there as it gained that energy so that and that em radiation which came and boom shocked it into action up moving it up it would be absorbed so it basically be absorbed out of the spectrum wherever the spectrum was going towards it in the first place and 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 also and when EM radiation was emitted, so let's say electromagnetic radiation was released. So it released um, electromagnetic radiation of say one frequency, specific frequency. If this, let's say this electron wanted to move from here to here, what would happen is electromagnetic radiation would be emitted. Obviously here it's being absorbed, but here it would be emitted because it's going from a high energy level to a lower energy level. So that energy which was was in it when it was here must go somewhere since this doesn't have the energy here, and it's, it releases electromagnetic radiation. And the fourth principle 
which which links from this third principle basically stated that the energy levels are fixed therefore and that's that means therefore Therefore, the the radiation, the frequent. Oh, let me get rid. This is really messy. The 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 frequency of the radiation was was basically fixed for for a specific transition. So let's say it was moving from point. From from shell A to shell shell B, the 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 and this is the electron. Let's say this is the electron, and let me change the color for the actual radiation and movement. Let's say absorb the, this particular frequency. This frequency would always be the same if this electron is going from here to here. It would not be any other frequency. The energy is fixed because the energy energy levels are fixed. And if this electron, let's say it got down there and it wanted to gain some energy so that it can move back up to a higher energy level as it moves up here oops oops this arrow is wrong uh because yeah it would be releasing energy if it was moving to a low energy level but yeah if it was moving to a low energy level that energy that electromagnetic radiation emitted would have a fixed frequency and the one the, when it moves from here to here the electromagnetic radiation it absorbs now would be fixed and it would be the same as these two because the difference in energy between these two levels is fixed based on the third principle that we had before because this is stuff that he found from his experiments so all of this stuff fitted with his experimental experimental discoveries so yeah Now, for example, the noble gases don't really react that much, and his model accounts for this. His model explains why noble gases are so inert and they're so unreactive. Because Bohr basically said, along with his model, he he said that the the um each of these shells, these shells of specific energy levels. They, if they are, they can be filled with a specific number of electrons. They can only have so many electrons in each one. And if an atom has a full shell of elect, full shell, full shells. If all of the shells on this uh, particular atom are full, then that atom is going to be stable and very, very unreactive. So let me think of the smallest noble gas, helium. Helium is a noble gas. Helium has two protons and two neutrons and its shell which I'll draw like this this is its shell its first shell and it only has one shell has two electrons in it and the, f the first shell of that yeah, we're saying a shell as well I'll explain what they are in a further video these shells can only hold two electrons Th this shell can only hold two electrons and it's full so it's unreactive it's not very reactive Whereas if we go to something like sodium, ah, let me get rid of this. If we go to something like sodium, I'm not going to draw the whole, whole, all of these shells of sodium, but this is the nucleus of sodium, and this is the outer shell of sodium. The outer shell of sodium can hold about eight electrons, I think. The outer shell of sodium has only one electron, whereas there's so many spaces for more. For more electrons you know as it could get seven more but it's only got one right here so it's very reactive very reactive because it's not full and this goes with Bohr's model now there's also like in recent times you know Bohr's model is from quite a while ago now but there have been much more recent models of the atom such as the quantum model I'll try and draw a little little prick picture of of the of the quantum mode right here let's say this is the nucleus uh, here 
Oop, that's not round. But yeah, that's the nu nucleus. Um, basically, what the quantum model shows is that you see that spray stuff. Or, uh, oh, I. Uh, let me do this again. Let me see this again. Where's the, this is the nucleus. There we go. And let's say this is the electron. Well, bleh. let me draw it first. This is a region where electrons might be. Vroom, vroom. And then wait, let me draw another one in red. Here. Vroom. And basically, this is the quantum model of, of the atom. It's a much more recent model. Quantum. Wait, uh, Oh, wait, right, I've got the wrong pen. Quantum, well, uh, yeah. Quantum. This is the quant. Quantum. Oh, my pen is way too thick. Okay. This is the quantum model of the atom. And as you can see, these look really strange, kind of. What this model basically shows is that this area where you can see a lot of green is one shell, and this area where you see the red is another shell. But as you can see, the, the, the sort of concentration of these little green dots changes. This is more, more concentrated here than here, and this red thing is more concentrated here than, say, here. And what this shows is that an electron is likely here it's likely to be in this area than than here so it's more likely to be in this place right here than here where you don't see much concentrated green and same thing for this it's more likely here where it's red concentrated than here where it's not so concentrated <coughs> and there's all sorts of other stuff with the quantum model like I'm not going to go into that in this video Anyway, that basically concludes this video. It's quite long. But I hope you got something from this video. The end. Bye.